Um, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Hoover and I'm the Metadata and Scholarly Communications Librarian at the Himmelfarb Health Sciences Library. Um, I oversee the Himmelfarb Scholarly Communications Committee at GW and today I'm joined by Dr. Rohini Ganju and Dr. Lisa Schwartz who are here to talk about not only one but two books they have recently edited and published. Uh, the first book is called The Handbook of Research on Advising and Developing the Free Health Professional Student, and it focuses on current research about preparation of undergraduate students who wish to enter the health professions. Uh, the second book is called The Handbook of Research on Developing Competencies for Pre-Health Professional Students, Advisors, and Programs, and it looks at critical skills needed for those interested both in working in healthcare, um, kind of as well as resources for those looking to support these individuals during their academic and professional careers. I'm sure you guys will pro probably provide a better description of these books as we go forward. But um, today we're going to talk about not only these wonderful edited volumes um, that Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Ganju published, but kind of also what they learned during the process of working as editors and authors. So Dr. Ganju and Dr. Schwartz, thank you for joining us today. Um, let's just kind of get started with kind of big picture questions. So uh, can you start by describing these books and how they became about? Sure. Um, and Sarah and Laura, thank you so much for, for having us today. And for those who are interested in learning a bit more about this topic, um, this was for both myself and uh, Dr. Ganju, a new adventure. Um, we both were authors of a chapter in a book regarding teaching ethics um, and it, or teaching online. And the chapter we contributed related to ethics. And it was published by IGI Global. Um, and I suspect that they send out a email to all contributors of um, all the different books that they publish, um, basically saying, if you have an idea for a book, then send it to us. Um, so both um, Dr. Ganju and I have been involved with uh, educating pre-health professional students, both uh, pre-medical students, um, medical lab science students. I um, have a role within our department advising students who are also looking at other health professions like PA, PT, and um, I am a member of a national association of advisors for health professions where I am fortunate to have a lot of resources at my disposal, but as a mem but you have to be a member uh, to get a lot of those resources. And I thought there were a number of faculty and staff at universities, um, both community colleges and um, colleges, uh, four-year universities, who don't have the luxury of having access to that um, information, um, but are all involved with helping and supporting these students who are interested in health professions. So I was like, let's you know see if we can um, pitch this idea to this um, you know, publisher and see if they may be interested. So we came up with some ideas of sort of what the books would look like, and it was accepted as uh, the proposal was accepted. Nice. That kind of leads nicely into my next question. I feel like I'm working with faculty all the time who come to me and are like, I got this request from a publisher to publish a book or an article and kind of like, how do I know it's legitimate? So I guess, did you have any concerns about the legitimacy of the publisher? And if so, do you have any recommendations for colleagues who might be frequently approached by publishers and about what's worth their time? Yeah, I think it's a really important question and one that faculty should consider for sure. Um, of course, I had had an opportunity to do some work with this publisher through this previous chapter, but never as an editor myself. Um, so I met with the um, individual who had sent, who had told me that the proposal, actually even before I put the proposal in, um, we I talked to the person who had solicited uh, the proposal to ask a little bit more questions about the publisher itself, about the process, about what our role would be. I also asked for a recommendation of another faculty member who had published with them or had been an editor uh, and was connected with one at another totally different university um, to share her experience um, as well as you know 
know, just learn more about the process, but also, again, whether or not this was a good publisher to work with. Uh, I talked with some other colleagues who had published with um, other publishers to get, to kind of find out sort of what are some of the questions I should be asking. And, and also did a search, you know, just an internet search, just to see if there was anything written out there about this particular publisher. And I'm glad that I had done all of that due diligence because uh, some of our contributors point blank asked some of those questions too. You know, is this a legitimate publisher? Do I want to have my name associated with this? Um, and so we were able to confidently say that, yes, you know, we had heard good things. We felt confident that this was going to be a good group to work with. Yeah, and um, I'd like to add that we also went online and we looked at the other books and um, like chapters that IGI had published just to kind of see, you know, what the um, condition was almost. And we were very happy. We were pleased and we had, had a great working experience with the ethics chapters. So I think we were pretty um, assured that it was a good, good, you know, good horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the questions we get kind of about predatory publishing and things like that. Um, your strategies that you recommend are definitely what we tell people to like look at what what else the editor has published you know do you value kind of the, the information that people have put out there so those are some great suggestions um kind of changing gears to talk about the content in the book um how did you decide what types of content you wanted to include in these volumes and how did you go about soliciting chapters um, that's a great question, and that's kind of where the meat of the um, book chapters are. So what we had um, put, you know, when we were writing the proposal, we sat down and we we were thinking out, like, what are parts of, like, advising a student that would be really important? And so when we put the proposal together that we had sent um, to the publisher, we kind of highlighted and outlined that, you know, these are the areas that we want to target and we want to focus on. Um, obviously, it wasn't very detailed or nuanced. <clears throat> there was like more of a general um, overview that, you know, we want to hit this area and this area and this area. And once the publisher went ahead and, you know, they approved our proposal and they said that, yeah, you were you know, good to go. What we did is we we sat down and we brainstormed and we like dug deep into all of our resources. So the first thing, of course, like, you know, we at GW, we have such incredible faculty. We have um, the most, uh, you know, helpful and um, all of these colleagues and peers. So we, you know, we sent out emails to folks um, like, you know, that this is our proposal, we gave them like a short, short synopsis of the proposal and told them that um, this is what we're looking to do. Would you be interested in contributing a book, uh, to the book? Um, we we um, reached out on our LinkedIn. Um, we um, Lisa is a member of MAP, like she was mentioning. So she sent out, um, you know, some emails to folks she knew and we tried to kind of, and then wherever we had, like we thought that we're, you know, we were lacking someone. We like actively went in and looked for folks that we needed or we reached out to others that, hey, do you know someone like in the, I, I remember one of the areas was um, the speech and language pathology. Um, area and we, you know, we we didn't have any proposals that came in from um, authors. So um, we went and we asked somebody who connected us to somebody who was like, "Oh, sure, I can do that." So it was a lot of back and forth, but um, we really had to dig deep into our um, our resources and all of our friends, and and um, it was pretty um, amazing that you know of everybody that came through. That's fantastic. Um, I think in the health sciences, I work with a lot of researchers who are very used to publishing journal articles, mm -hmm. and then they come to a book and it's a little less familiar in terms of the territory and the process. Um, so what are some of the differences you notice between publishing a journal article and publishing a book? You know, we, right off the bat, I think when we were talking about the book, we knew that we wanted to include researchers, but we also wanted to include like staff and advisors because they are such an integral part of us, this whole advising process. So um, would we like, you know, like as, as a, if, you know, as a staff member, I wouldn't really be publishing a peer-reviewed research article, but a book chapter is more doable. There is a lot more of, um, like, you know, we can add our own personal narrative or any, our examples of things we do. Um, we also realized that, um, you know, that the, the book chapters, all of them were peer-reviewed. So every chapter that came in, we had um, two 
peer review, like two authors. So we, we reached out to some authors, we reached out to the editorial board. So we reached out to multiple people. And so every chapter was reviewed by two different people. And then we read the chapters and we um, reviewed them. So it was a pretty stringent peer review process that was, um, you know, for the book chapters too. But I would honestly say that um, in my opinion, it wasn't as, um, you know, as stringent as it would be for a research article. And we wanted all of these chapters to kind of stand alone in the book. So um, we made sure that folks were including, a, a, you know, a background um, and, and they had, they like RGI wanted them to follow a format. So that's a little different from where, you know, you have research papers where there's a lot of analysis, um, discussing the trends based on what your data looks like, which was not as much in these book chapters. So a few subtle differences um, that, you know, we noticed in the process, but I think Having done both, so I contributed, um, Lisa did too, to the um, book. I like, you know, the same kind of rush that you get when a um, peer reviewed article is published. I got the same feeling from the book chapter, and it was very, um, you know, just made you feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that comment leads really nicely into my next question, which is kind of like you covered a lot the nuances between peer review versus a book versus an article. Um, did you find with a book chapter, it was more iterative in a way, rather than like with a journal article, you get the reviewer comments, you like, was there, I guess, more back and forth as part of the peer review process? Um, I think there was, and um, definitely, um, there definitely was a, a lot more of that back and forth. And um, like both of us, you know, we would go in and look at all what the reviewer, the comments that they had made, and uh, we would then go in and like, make sure that we read the chapter and and kind of try to understand the perspectives that um folks were coming in with so that we could then you know like yes you know when you have a peer-reviewed um, article then the you know the editors will send like send out a note but it's very pointed and very um i would say specific but here it was a lot a lot of different kind of things that I uh, that that came up in the peer review process, um, and and the topic in itself, like you know, advising and developing competencies, is it there's so much to cover, and there's like, <laughs> I, like I feel it's just such a big job, um, such a big uh, content area, so it's very hard to be extremely specific and like some of the chapters have tools that folks can use for advising students. Some chapters are more based on, um, you know, their personal experiences of how they have um, advised students. So like each chapter was different. And so it was a lot of like understanding, you know, what the author really wants to present to the um, readers, I would say. Yeah, I think that's a really great overview of kind of the process of that might be a little unique to books um, in this area. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, Lisa, sorry. I was just gonna add, I mean, to, to put it also into some context. So this was again, our, our first time doing this and the publishers actually, the IGI Global were very helpful along the process. They assigned us a developmental editor um, who gave us, you know, sort of tips and um, although she had to actually was new to the company herself, but, you know, very responsive to our many, many questions um, and, and said, you know, look, this, at first we thought the book would be 15 chapters um, and that we would want to accept about 30 proposals because typically in her experience, 50% of proposals don't even come through. Well, I guess we have colleagues who were really rooting for us and this uh, supportive of this project because near we had over 60 or you know, maybe more proposals that came through and nearly all of them um, ultimately were transformed into chapters that were submitted. And, and unfortunately, we did not accept all chapters. We did, again, it did go through a peer review process. And once we got all the chapters in, we could, you know, some were just not up to the standards that we wanted to maintain for the book, or they had too much overlap in some of the content. Um, that actually, that was an interesting process because we were, as we were getting proposals, some of them were 
pretty similar in terms of content or topic. And we actually encouraged some of our contributors who didn't otherwise know each other, they were coming from other you know, institutions across the country to consider working with each other. And we actually established through this process a number of collaborations mm -hmm. um, that we've learned since people have you know, really valued working with a colleague from GW that they, and they were from a totally other university, but they both were focusing on say nursing and that has formed you know, potentially a, an ongoing working relationship too, which is really interesting. And that's partly why this ended up into two books. It was never intended to be two books. We just actually ended up having so many you know, chapters and they were just all so, you know, well-written and had so much to offer. And then when it came to actually dividing them into, into two different books, they really aligned well together, the topics. That's great. Yeah. Having worked in book publishing in the past, I can say like having that much content come through and like pan out is a little bit unique, but wonderful. And I would just like for an edited volume, emphasize the importance of like the collaborations you build by seeing people <laughs> writing similar things and just seeing different areas. And it's a really valuable process in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of bigger picture, what was it like to create an editorial board? And is there anything you wish you had known about that process? Um, we were actually told that it was an option. We didn't have to have an editorial board, but again, given that this was our first time doing this, we thought that it would be incredibly helpful um, and also wanted to offer the opportunity to some of our colleagues um, to, to be part of the project. And it turned out the editorial board was incredibly helpful. Um, they served as reviewers for multiple chapters. Um, they also, we met with them periodically through the process to give them updates and they also helped us in identifying contributors where we saw there was maybe some holes as the proposals were coming in on topics that we really thought were important to be covered. Um, and they also offered us some advice. I mean, some of our editorial board members had done publishing before. Mm -hmm. um, so they were able to reassure us, you know, yes, you know, you have to be on top of these people in terms of deadlines. It's okay to give them a dead drop date that you, you're going to not accept it. You know, we wanted to really be supportive and not say no, but we were learning how to do that through our editorial board. So having, and I think having to be able to, um, you know, publish as part of the book that we had an editorial board gave the books more um, legitimacy as well, that it wasn't just some pet project that Rohini and I put together, but we had, a, you know, an oversight board that was really integral in, in the entire project. Yeah, I think as you've probably all seen in your, your own peer work as peer reviewers, like you, those time frames can be very fragile and very <laughs> difficult to deal with. So it's it's really amazing that you were able to kind of deal with all of that. Um, let's talk about the detailed copy editing and editorial process for this project. Um, with so many different authors, how did you go about establishing a, consi a consistent tone and kind of what was the copy editing process like? Yeah, so this is probably one of the more complicated parts of the whole project um, because you are getting um, you know, work that's coming from individuals who have perhaps a lot of scientific writing experience, some that haven't. So sometimes the tone could be quite different. Um, and through the peer review, we would certainly offer suggestions to help the authors who maybe weren't as experienced to bring the you know, the level of their writing to a high, higher level, which I think turned into a great learning experience for them, professional development experience. Um, but we also, um, you know, like I said, we, we kind of put this wide net out and it really was fortuitous the way that things all worked out together. Um, just having, um, being able to, even with having to divide the book, the chapters into multiple books, and then we had multiple sections. They just really seemed to flow really well. In terms of copy editing, um, IGI Global offered a template that we distributed out to everyone that was quite specific. And we said, look, you know, you don't have to follow it to the T, but you have in terms of like the headings, but we're like, you have to put it in the font that they want and the size and this bolded and this not bolded. And Rohini and I truthfully were doing some of that as the chapters came in. And then we realized this is really too much for us to do. And we would push them back and say, no, 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 we're not going to accept these chapters until you fix them up. Um, double checking, 
references was um, a, a labor of love that Rohini and I did. And again, we often, with, we had to send back some chapters to ask people to double check that anything that was recited within the chapter was also in the references and, and vice versa. Um, and even though um, IGI Global offers like a um, formal copy editing, um, we, I believe maybe one or two of the chapters actually took advantage of that service, um, but for some it was cost prohibitive. So we encourage those authors to, you know, share with their colleagues or like, you know, go to, especially those who were, were not as um, experienced in writing these type of, you know, this type of work. We're like, go to some of your colleagues and ask them to do some editing for you. Um, again, not necessarily looking for typos, but looking for, you know, the way that you're doing your citations, making sure that you're writing them, you know, your writing is clear. Um, and, and it really worked out, you know, that really worked out well. We actually encourage some of our colleagues to utilize uh, their writing centers at their universities. So I know that at least one or two of our chapters, um, again, the writing center, I don't want to advertise them as a copy editing service. They are absolutely not. Um, but they said that they would be happy to really like read aloud with the authors to make sure that the writing was clear and, and that they were, you know, it was, it was clean. So that was another option for copy. Yeah, I think the other, uh, we also had um, encouraged folks that they have graduate students or they new students, like, you know, and that, it's a good experience both ways for the grad student also to kind of go in and read um, the writing. So yeah, we were trying to be creative because uh, some folks really didn't want to spend, um, I, I forget what the cost was related to the copy editing, but they didn't want to spend that money in. Um, understandably so, but but at, at one point, you know, we had to push back and be like, no, you, if you, you know, you want to go ahead and get it read. But I think every, every single chapter that came in was copy edited when it came to us. And mm -hmm. so that was nice. But, and um, certainly once all the chapters were submitted, um, the publisher goes through and makes sure that everything is in the right font. And then we both, that all the contributors, or at least the lead authors, and Rohini and I had proofs that we were able to make any oh, right. slight changes, make sure anything was, you know, everything was correct. Yeah. How many levels of proofs did you go through? Was it two or three or just one? I think it was only one, That's but great. It was, so yeah. we went through every chapter together, mm -hmm. um, and I said so that was at least sort of a two reads, and then the authors were expected to also go through them as well. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I mean, honestly, like, I'm sorry, okay, but in, I mean, I guess this could be another difference, or it could be just be a publisher thing, but, you know, anytime I've done proofs of peer-reviewed um, research, like the proofs have been pretty consistent and there hasn't been, like, it doesn't require, plus it's also, I think, a sh much shorter text. But in this, when we went in and we looked at the proofs, we did definitely find a few things that, you know, so that proofing stage was important too. Yeah, it usually tends to be more time consuming and more invaluable. <laughs> so, um, and, and truthfully, by that time, Rohini and I had read each of these chapters, like I don't know how many times. So to read, you know, of course, once you read something numerous times, you just can't read word for word that easily. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so just kind of going bigger picture, um, did you find that thinking about the audience for a book was somewhat different than thinking about the audience for a journal article? Um, and definitely. Uh, Marie and I, most of our work has been um, publishing in journals related to our research. Um, so we assume that those who are reading those articles are going to be, you know, looking to see kind of what the work that we did, our findings, you know, maybe even wanting to replicate some of the, the work that we did. Whereas, you know, these chapters were really not intended to do that. They were really more um, discussions on the topic. They integrated, of course, published literature um, into the background. But then a lot of the uh, chapters included shared experiences that some of these advisors had with actual students, of course, with all names um, removed. One of the most impactful chapters were um, written by two current medical students, one who was a DACA student, one who was an international student. Um, so they were really speaking more from their own perspective. Um, and so we wanted the book certainly to be more engaging. <laughs> um, and we wanted people who didn't necessarily have all this background to be able to pick up 
an individual chapter, as Rohini had mentioned before, we wanted each chapter to really kind of stand on its own and have enough context that someone who, you know, was, we knew that the book wasn't going to be picked up like and read like a novel. Um, but we wanted each chapter to be very readable, um, relatable, and I think that, you know, we were successful in, in doing that. Um, and, and again, we thought that there would be advisors, um, there would be faculty who maybe don't necessarily do a lot of advising, or more biology professors, chemistry professors, but are working with these students. Also administrators um, and people in student affairs, career services. So it was a really broad audience, too, which made it a little bit more challenging with a journal, you know, normally just by the title of the journal, you know that your audience is going to be a pretty limited group. Um, so that somewhat made it more challenging, but I think a bit more interesting as well. Nice. Um, and kind of was that your experience, uh, Rohini, as well? Or, you know, I, how, I'm not sure your difference, how much you publish books versus articles or anything like that. Yeah. Definitely, like Lisa, I've published a lot more articles. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, this is very different because, you know, with an article, you're so focused. You have um, like a small word count. You want to get like everything in and like just go straight to the content and a lot of time spent in that analysis portion. But um, so I do think, yeah, completely uh, agree with Lisa. And it was just, uh, it was also... I almost I'd say like liberating in the sense that you know we didn't have to stick to one kind of thing so as the chapters came in like you know above and beyond what I think Lisa and I could have thought of, of things folks had written about things or included um, examples um, different you know tools that students could use advisors could use faculty could use resources so like it was such a like almost like an you know amalgamation of all of these different things that came in to bring um, everything together so yeah I think the, the uh, it was the um, audience that made it so much more worthwhile that's great um, so kind of what did the timeline for this project end up looking like um, was it longer than a journal article shorter? Um, so in terms of the timeline, we, you know, when you log into the IDI portal, they have like a, almost like a tracker, which tells you that, you know, between now and let's say December, you are accepting proposals from faculty, uh, from chap, uh, from chapter authors, and then the next three months you are reviewing it. And so they have a kind of a timeline drawn out for um, you on the portal. And in all honesty, what we did, um, Lisa and I, is that every week we set aside, like we had just blocked every week, um, like a couple of hours, two, three times a week that we would sit and we would work through the whole process. So we really stayed on top of things. And um, we, I mean, we, I, I, I mean, I, I'm almost, I don't know, but I'd like to believe that we were the only people ever who were a big, before schedule, everything we were hitting all the targets like oh the deadline is like two weeks later we were already done but I think it was truly because we uh we worked together which I think um maybe we're not talking about enough the fact that if you are co-editing or working with someone else you really have to have an incredible rapport with that person to um you know just know how to work together and the timing and you know be be in sync so we the um the publisher had like guidelines set up based on how much time we would take and you know as we mentioned we started off with like one book thinking we might have 13 to 15 chapters and then we ended up with almost 45 chapters so we doubled the amount of work almost tripled the amount of work that we were going to do um, and so for, I mean, in terms of the timeline, I think like two, three months was every step of the way um, given to us much, much broader for as editors than it would have been for a research, like, you know, an article. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it was, it was sufficient for us. I mean, all told from the time we did the proposal till the book was published, I think was about a year. Yeah. Um, but as Rohini said, that they gave us sort of guideposts is like, this is when you should be soliciting proposals for chapters. This is when the chapters should be coming in for peer review. This is when peer review should go out. This is when they should come back. And we were just really dead set on sticking to that timeline. Um, and looking back, what we, what we would have probably changed is to see if we could have adjusted the timeline a little bit. Um, 
I'm sure our authors and certainly our peer reviewers were not pleased to hear that we had very short term turnaround times uh, around the holidays, the, the winter break, <laughs> uh, and the beginning of the fall semester. So if we had, in you know, hindsight now, we would have seen that that time frame didn't really work well for an academic institution. <laughs> um, but that's okay. It, obviously, it worked out. But we were very much on top of our um, contributors and the peer reviewers and on, our, on each other uh, to, to do the work. Um, and the, the our development editor was like, oh, you guys are really great. You guys are doing this really fast. So we kind of got the impression that we were a pretty well-oiled machine, <laughs> to say the least. But we do have a really great working relationship too. And I mean, we should say we did all of this, of course, you know, through Zoom, sharing our screen, sharing box, you know, at the same time. So, you know, we just took advantage of, of our electronic devices too. That segues nicely into my next question, kind of just like, is there anything you wish you had known before starting this process? Yes, that no deadline should be near the Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> or actually the beginning of the semester when you get starting or the end of the semester when you're finishing grading. It looks like um, there's probably no great time to do it. Yeah. That's and yeah, that's what we kept telling ourselves. That's what we kept telling ourselves also, that there's never going to be the right time. So we've got to, you know. Um, yeah, and um, in the end, it worked out really well, but that the project definitely got bigger than we had originally expected. You know, like I, like I said, we were kind of under this impression, oh, you know, 15 chapters. And now when we look back, we're like, no wonder we had to spend so much time. You know, we would have been done this even faster if we had only been working with 15 chapters. Nice. And switching gears, um, let's talk a little bit about the information in these two volumes. Um, what kind of what makes the content in this book unique or these books? Um, I think back to your original question, sort of like, why do we do this? Um, you know, there are professional advisors, um, staff advisors, as well as faculty who have advising as part of their job description, who have, who kind of live and breathe this stuff, right? So they have the information at their disposal. Um, and of course, a lot is out there on the internet in terms of application deadlines and prerequisites, but there's a lot of nuance to helping a student really prepare themselves to be health professionals, not just from the application standpoint, but just in their own development. You know, what are the experiences that you really need to delve into, not just to make your application competitive, but to make sure this is the right field for you. Um, and also from a program perspective, you know, what are the supports that are really integral to make students be successful through this process? And so we wanted the books to have that type of information. So some are a little bit nuts and bolts. Um, the first book, has a number of chapters dedicated to specific health professions. We, I don't know if it was purposeful, but medicine is not one of the chapters. Right. I mean, most people, of course, you know, when you, if you pick up a pre-health professions book, medicine is front and center. But we also wanted to make sure that people remember that there are a whole host of other health professions um, for which students may be much better, a much better fit um, and that are much more attainable um, for certain students. And to just keep everybody's eyes open, not just the students, but those who are advising and helping to develop them. So we have one of the first chapters in the book is um, genetic counseling, which is is my own background. Um, so I had solicited some colleagues to, to do that chapter. Um, as we mentioned before, speech and hearing, um, well, uh, speech language pathology. We had our colleagues from the School of Nursing, um, from PT and OT, you know, what the heck's the difference? Um, so, um, dentistry, you know, vet. So we really tried to make it very um, you know, diverse in terms of health professions. Um, and and also in the first book, we talk a little bit more about like the nuts and bolts of the application, sort of like how do you help a student with their personal statement? What are some key issues in helping students in preparing for their interviews? Um, some of those things. And I'll let Rahimi talk about the second book. Um, thank you, Lisa. And I just, I, I wanted to go back to that question where um, you, um, Sarah, about, um, you know, things we've learned or what we would have done differently. I think what we did learn um, afterwards was, or, or, you know, eventually was that we really need to, uh, like, because everybody is so busy and, and um, in, you know, and things we get caught, like people get caught up with things. So during the peer review process, as well as during when we had the um, chapters coming in, 
we a lot like a lot of deadlines were were like missed and we had to uh, gently nudge people so i did not realize how much gentle nudging would be needed um definitely and i think that was a like a huge big learning curve for me especially because um, you know, these are all really well-known people in their fields. And here I am like, please, I need this. And so it, that was, that was big learning for me, <laughs> learning process for me. <laughs> we definitely learned how to be nags for sure. <laughs> yes. Um, and so in terms of, um, you know, the books, the second books was a lot of competence, competency development. And um, we had to, you know, look at how we can, like what oops uh, Rahini got um, knocked up this is interesting let me, uh, let me, let me, I, will, uh, she I think I've that. locked the I've locked the meeting too <laughs> so I let me unlock that, it so she can at least join back in oh uh, well she was the one who who started so she yeah be, I know her internet at home can be a little unsafe. oh okay a little bit and I'm sorry okay. Sarah now oh you know, no no <laughs> a little bit more editing to do that. it's fine there's great software for that out there now so um but i mean i can fill in for the second and we'll right yeah yeah um so in terms of the second book um again we weren't anticipating having two but we realized that the chapters really worked very well that the first book was really like i said this nuts and bolts mm -hmm. of um, advising but the second book all the chapters really floated around this idea of competency development mm -hmm. um, and among all the pre-health professions you know the Free health students are intended are expected to have developed certain competencies at the time mm -hmm. that they're applying. Um, right. So they're not expected, of course, to know how to draw blood or how to do, you know, a physical exam, but they should know how to work with teams. They should have some understanding of, you know, unconscious bias or implicit bias, and they should understand, um, you know, just professionalism issues. So a lot of the chapters sort of are structured around those issues, um, not just for how to help the student develop that, but also the advisor. You know, some are, what are some of the competencies that an advisor is going to uh, understand? We had one chapter that was written, you know, really so um, the person was obviously very passionate about the topic um, in terms of ensuring, you know, racial equity among the health professionals and that advisors should not be in the place of being gatekeepers somehow. So to keep your biases, you know, in check and recognize mm -hmm. that they are there when you're advising students. Um, so though, and then even from an institutional perspective, what are some things that, and one of our colleagues, Miranda Ward and a group of other faculty and staff um, in health sciences contributed a chapter related to how do you make your organization um, support anti-racism, um, advising and developing of students, both at the pre-health as well as the health professional level. Um, so again, the books together, I, I think complement each other, but it turned out well that the chapters were able to easily be divided. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Rohini, we were just kind of discussing the second volume. If there's anything you'd like to add, feel free, otherwise. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, okay. I don't know, my internet went and I'm like, I have no idea, so no worries. I'm good. <laughs> No worries. I kind of filled in. You're <laughs> um, just kind of wrapping up today. I think one limitation we see really frequently with edited academic books, I think you've already mentioned this, is cost. Um, do you have any recommendations for helping other researchers get access to the contents in your book? And I'm happy to talk about like what the library has in terms of that perspective yeah. too. Well, certainly, you know, we were very fortunate that we um, were trusted that when we reached out to our library, <laughs> that they would be hopefully receptive to, you know, adding it to their collection, which obviously you all were. And we encouraged all of our contributors, um, not just the lead authors, but all of them to do the same. And we know that a number of them have. We've gotten some pictures, we're seeing it on LinkedIn, you know, people holding copies of their books that they checked out of their libraries or um, they were able to access it. So, so I know that through IGI Global, people can purchase individual chapters. Um, so you don't have to get the entire book, um, which makes it a little bit less cost prohibitive. But certainly if you can get your academic library to subscribe you know, to the book or to you know, purchase it or add it to their collection, that would make it accessible to individuals. Um, and we were talking about this even before um, you know, this presentation, that Unfortunately, it seems to be the way publishing is going. I mean, even in academic journals, 
somebody's going to pay the cost. So it's either going to be, you know, if it's going to be an open access journal, um, then the authors are going to have to pay. And, you know, as authors of journal articles, you know, we have to either, you know, ask, make sure our department is willing to pay some pretty hefty fees, you know, sometimes in the order of three or four thousand dollars, you know, for a single article to get published. Um, or when we put into grants, you know, when it comes to disseminating the work, that that is going to be something we're going to have to have as a line item. So in some ways, it didn't seem that different, right? The book we were in charge as editors. We didn't have to charge the authors or contributors. Um, so they, we all got the benefit of having this work out there um, without having the expense. But of course, on the other end, people who want to buy it are going to have to pay a pretty hefty price. Um, we were able, at least IGI Global allows any contributors to get a pretty steep discount on the work, um, either their chapter or the book. Uh, so that, um, I think was helpful, at least to those who were part of the project. Yeah, and I think that does sometimes people wonder about the cost of these books and monographs, and I think they don't realize that, you know, for these open access journal articles, it really is the authors paying those article processing charges and things like that, kind of on the front end that kind of subsidizes it. And so what you're seeing is that cost kind of within the book. And that's where a library can be a really great resource um, for kind of accessing that content. Um, and we do have um, electronic copies, Himmelfarb has electronic copies of both of those. And so with the recording, I will be definitely sure to include those links. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Um, again, if you're a Himmelfarb library user, I will include the links to these books. Um, in the, along with the recording. Um, if you're looking to have another library purchase a copy of these materials, um, please see the recommend to librarian link on the publisher website. Again, I'll include that link as well. And unless there are any other questions or things you guys would like to discuss, um, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you so much.